I thought I would start by telling you um, how we came to this problem, the series of people who have worked on this issue with me. Um, I'm not an economist, and all of you are economists, I think. I'm a sociologist, so I have a slightly different perspective uh, than you do, being more concerned uh, with organizations and less concerned with individuals and more concerned with social processes than with markets, but certainly with both. Um, the United States in the 80s uh, started to shift from what we call a public good regime with regard to universities to what we came to call an academic capitalist knowledge learning regime. Um, and it was a slow process. It probably took 20 years to accomplish. And it was only accomplished incompletely, as most things are. They were sort of layered over each other, both the old and the new. And we started watching this unfold, or particularly uh, with the beginning of the Reagan administration in um, 1980. But even before the Reagan administration, we had a change in the way we funded students in the U.S. It used to be that tuition was extremely low in the U.S. In many states, like California, for example, and in New York, it was free. And we're talking about the 70s now, 1975, as it is still in Europe um, in many places, but far from all these days. And the decision was made <coughs> largely through um, corporate leaders in the Committee for Economic Development working with the federal government uh, and um, some universities, but not all, to shift monies from giving it to institutions who then gave it to students to giving money to students who would then choose among universities. This was a market model of higher education with the student as the consumer. And this starts like 1973. And the idea was that students would choose and universities would um, compete for them and through economies of scale tuition would stay low and remain low because students would pick the university of choice. However, higher education in most countries is not a market in the sense which is used in the um, sort of uh, neoliberal sense, much less the, um, no, nor even in the Keynesian sense. But, um, what, and what happened, of course, was not that tuition remained low, but tuition only went up. All right, so the market model, as a market model, where students chose and universities that were efficient expanded and created economies of scale simply did not work. Tuition went from a couple of hundred dollars a semester for students, or free, to probably the average price for undergraduates at non-elite universities is now about twelve or $13,000 a year, even at the cheapest state. And in the more expensive states, it's more than that. So we have um, a market model that didn't work. So I became interested in this and interested in um, what was uh, going on and what the dynamic was. And the next big move in the marketization of higher education or the failed market of, uh, marketization of higher education, if you want to say, say it that way, um, I wrote about uh, in the mid-'80s. And that was the move to um, use science to make the United States competitive globally. And that starts in the U.S. in the 80s, where you really push, again, primarily with business leaders taking the lead. And what 
I guess you would call NGOs, but it's you know civil society organizations and think tanks of um, um, created by business leaders independently, although still in close relationships with government. Um, and this one was called the Business Higher Education Forum, which started in probably 1979, and it's big push to start with was the Bayh-Dole Act, which is passed in um, 1980 and revised in 1983. And the Bayh-Dole Act was the one where universities were able to own the patents um, for um, intellectual property uh, that they developed. Um, and that was uh, Again, a big shift. Corporations could get patents from universities prior to that, but it was a totally non-standardized process. And um, what was, uh, uh, and if it was done by with research from the mission agencies which funded universities, there was each one had a special process. Maybe you could do it, maybe you couldn't, and so on and so forth. So this standardizes it, so universities own the intellectual property that comes from federally funded research and they have their own um, regulations about what happens if that's not so. Uh, but it ends up that basically universities own intellectual property and they become market players in a sense. So um, that was a big move toward the market. And then the probably the biggest move was in um, the Clinton administration after the Cold War ends, since most of the research money in the United States up to this point had been Defense Department funding. And it was, it was a lot of money for a lot of science. And then we have what Clinton called the peace dividend, where you could switch over and say, we're not going to use this money just for defense anymore. We're going to use these federal agencies, uh, defense, they're a series of related agencies, the Defense Department, uh, um, National Aeronautics and Space um, Lab, which is also defense related, and the Department of Energy. Those three are basically focused on defense one way or another whether it's rockets or um, petroleum industries for fuel to secure your resources or just straight defense. And um, so they um, started doing civilian technology as well. And there were also then government agencies created to do civilian technology. So these three things, moved the U.S. by the early 1990s well toward um, entrepreneurial economy with science in universities being very important. Um, when did I start? Just so I can keep track of time a little bit. Okay. All right, and so now I'm going to think about um, uh, how the U.S. and the EU are related in all of this. That's basically what I'm going to talk about um, right now. And um, the EU also began to embrace global competition, although somewhat later than uh, the U.S. and um, the uh, EU took the position in the Lisbon Agreement that they were going to make the EU by 2010 the most competitive and most dynamic knowledge-based economy in the world. And they said the prize is first place in the smart economy. And when we look at how the EU and the US focus on competition, enables us to see different constraints that higher education faces, both professions and disciplines as knowledge economies mature. 
You can't see my nice PowerPoint slide on all of this because. <laughs> okay, but you can hear me and everything, right? Because the problem would be for translation. Some people can read a lot easily or than they can. So there were different paths to the market. In the U.S., the move, as I suggested when I was speaking earlier, uh, was uh, incremental. It was slow. It was led by nonprofits with strong ties to the for-profit sector, the sort of business um, think tank organizations and policy organizations I was just talking about. Um, it was very often concerned with um, policy formation at the national level rather than the state level. There were strong participation by segments of universities and segments of the faculty prior to federal uh, legislation mandates. Um, so some players in universities, both administrations and um, some faculty, were very engaged in um, moving toward uh, the market. Um, but it took a long time, and not everybody was happy about doing this. And at this point, uh, early on, and right now, I would say the U.S. has the most heavily marketized universities on the planet, which I'm not terribly happy about. Um, the EU took a different path. Uh, Myself and Brendan Cantwell, who, who wrote this piece, argue that reverse engineering of Anglo-American higher education models were used in the EU to reconstruct technologies of governance in uniquely European context. The aim was to embed competition in nation-state initiatives for universities. It was more supranational and state-led. In other words, it was more the EU and less the individual states. For example, when we think of uh, Germany, the, many of the German universities have to some degree resisted um, EU efforts to uh, shift toward competition. Other countries like Finland are some ways yes, some ways no. They're want to innovate, but they also don't want to really radically change the structure of the professions. I don't know how it is in France. Um, the, the structure of the profession? Well, well, the country. Do you want to keep things the way they were, or do you want to change in the universities? Uh, us? <laughs> yeah, no, 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 I meant, I meant generally. Uh, no, the government, I assume, wants to change. Yes. But, but what about... Have universities been able to resist? Uh, I, I think more of the, the direction of universities are not really wa wanting to resist to that. Uh, it's more uh, uh, professors' unions and that kind of thing that try to resist. And there are a, a lot of uh, differences across uh, teachers. Some want to move forward a more marketized, more US-like uh, uh, regulation and others are trying to, trying to resist and keep some uh, academic freedom in, in exchange to some more uh, regulated uh, yeah, profession. Okay. And that's how it was in the U.S. too. And of course, most of the people who resisted most strongly were um, social scientists and humanists. Um, rather than people in the um, physical sciences and the business schools and things like that, physical and biological sciences. But, but, but not all of them. Now, there were many who resisted there as well, but they were quite divided. Okay, so... Okay, so can you hear me better now? That's great. I don't have to yell. <laughs> All right, and soon we're going to have um, this part too. I hope so. 
I hope so. Yes. Okay. Merci. Okay. He's, he's going to? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, let me see where I was here. Here we go. So I see, and we, Brendan and I saw at the, the competition, the initial impetus coming more at the EU level than um, from the several states, although I'm sure over time that has changed. And, and, and the nation states variously are pushing more for it. And very often um, we, we see um, the management of universities as, as also championing the move toward the market or the marketization of universities um, because in many ways it strengthens their hand. Oh, have I? No, not yet. Okay. So the dim dimensions of comparison that um, we used when we were thinking about the U.S. and um, the EU were uh, sort of mechanisms that we talked about in our 2004 book, uh, Academic Capitalism's Market State and um, Higher Education. And the dimensions of comparison uh, were intermediating organizations, narratives, discourses, and social technologies, um, emerging interstitial organizations, and expanded managerial capacity, as well as new funding streams and new circuits of knowledge. Uh, all very sociological rather than economic, based on organizations. And that's what we were looking at. So when we looked at the US and we looked at intermediating organizations, those were organizations, in our view, that brought people together from different sectors. And they brought people together from um, universities, from the corporate world, from government, and from different um, um, factions within those areas. And among them were the Carnegie Commission on Science, Technology, and Government. That was a foundation. The Belfer Center on Science and International Affairs, which was located at Harvard. The Brookings Institution, which is a central centrist think tank. The American Enterprise Institute, which was uh, one that um, is um, more right-leaning. The Council on Competitiveness and the Business Higher Education Forum. So you had uh, many of these organizations with large um, proportion of corporate leaders in them that were moving to uh, push this uh, forward. Okay, there, there they are, the intermediating organizations that draw people together to um, push for certain policies. The Business Education Forum, which focused more directly on higher education than most, said early on, thus the forum makes only one overall recommendation as a nation. We must develop consensus that industrial competitiveness is crucial to our social and economic well-being. And key to that, was universities, was the effort to organize university science in the effort to be competitive. In the EU, the intermediating organizations we identified were the European Roundtable of Industrialists. That was 50 CEOs of European corporations seeking consensus for public institutions to aid the private sector in efficient allocation of labor within the European market, common market. And that was in the 80s. And then in e, another one is the EU created its own higher education business for, forum 
to serve the smart economy in 2008. Um, that was governed by business people and academics, and it fostered growth and global competitiveness by collaboration between universities and industry. And it has direct financial, organizational, and curricular influence on higher education. Um, in 2009, it started knowledge innovation communities that were multi-institutional, multi-country research, and business networks that generate academic-based commercial intellectual property and educating European scientists and entrepreneurs. You're not part of this, are you? No. Okay. <laughs> I was just wondering when you were describing the program if that could be the case. They get lots of money and the degrees come with the prefix EIT. Another way that the European Union um, did intermediating organizations was EC, European Community Expert Committees. And you, they drew experts from public, private, and nonprofit sectors. Sometimes these are permanent, sometimes they are temporary. And they increased by 40% since 2000. Um, so there were 1,200 plus expert groups by 2007. And of course, this is a creating a whole nother reward structure at the European Union level, um, largely for um, academics and um, other professionals. And the largest numbers of uh, committees are attached to the Director General for Research, followed by Environment and uh, Enterprise, and they pr promote competitiveness enterprise program. So what about these intermediating organizations? They're diverse, but the participants represent a rather limited segment of society. They tend to be business elites, mid to high ranking government officials, professionals with advanced degrees, such as yourselves will soon be, and um, high-level members of NGOs. They usually see advantage from rearranging the traditional distinct sectors of state nonprofits and for-profits to create new opportunities in a neoliberal frame. And that, of course, includes universities, which are largely state entities, in um, the EU, as uh, well as private universities, if they are nonprofit. Um, these intermediating organizations, especially in the EU, are becoming regular nodes of new opportunity. They are maybe creating new organizational fields with the potential to insert itself between modes of professional organizations, like learned disciplines, um, professional associations, various faculties and universities, and the neoliberal state, uh, weakening professional autonomy and control over uh, the um, fields of study in question. Um, and they and may end up, um, the intermediating uh, organizations, to some degree managing professions and universities that were to some degree independent. I think very few are ever really independent, but to some degree independent. Uh, narratives, discourses, and social technologies also play a big role in uh, shifting from one regime to another. Beginning in the 1980s, human capital and competitiveness were major narratives, and social technologies such as ranking and quality assessments and uh, things like that were used to uh, assess uh, the success of a university in, s in all aspects of competition. And so these are also um, working to, to change the narratives we traditionally told about universities. In US, the discourse was primarily human capital. 
was an emphasis on the individual benefits of higher education and how um, that uh, converts higher education into a private good. So that, in turn, um, justifies why students have to pay. Because if they're building their high, uh, uh, human capital, then they're the ones who reap the most of the reward. There is a social dimension to this, but in the United States, that's con continually devalued as time passes. Um, so student investment in higher education serves societal needs for a strong economy, and it also um, emphasizes innovation, technology revolutions, and new companies. And the individual student um, is seen as uh, the primary beneficiary in terms of the economic rewards they will reap uh, from the benefits of investment in higher education. So by the time of the Obama admin administration, this, this discourse is t completely normalized. I mean, it's totally what people say about higher education now. Well, not totally, but it, it, it's, it's the main story. And so scientific discovery and technological innovation are major engines of increasing productivity and are indispensable for creating economic growth, world-class, diverse technology, engineering, and mathematical mathematics workforce. And of course, left out of this is everything but what we call STEM fields. Do you call them that as well? Uh, no, I'm not sure. Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And, um, you know, I think it's fair to point out that at most universities, this is not the preponderance of undergraduate students, nor of graduate students. And in many countries, there are not even lots of jobs for such graduates unless they have advanced degrees. But this is the narrative, and if you critique it, even with Numbers and statistics, it just sort of is um, blown off. In the EU, the discourse is somewhat different. It's new public management, marketization to improve economy, and efficiency to modernize. Social technologies, such as ranking for world-class university systems, are another part of the discourse which drove national and EU um, initiatives. Examples are the UK research assessment exercise and the EU Lisbon strategy. Um, so you have increased researcher and student mobility, new management systems with greater accountability, incentives for academic industry partnerships, education programs geared to meet labor market demands, increased R&D funding and generation of external revenues, encouragement of interdisciplinary research or stakeholder engagement, reward of excellence through differential pay, and marketing the European research area through global initiatives. And all of these, at one level or another, um, create uh, hierarchy and stratification within your uh, uh, university uh, systems at the national level and at the EU level, in that um, greater mobility means that the people who move, it's often better for them when they return to their national system. And my colleague I work with in Finland says, if you don't go overseas, you won't get um, a permanent university position, and that's the same way for students. In fact, you're all from different countries. You're part of this sort of move in an effort to, to create distinction for yourselves and to be more competitive in this um, new uh, knowledge um, and innovation-driven economy. The new management systems um, draw in corporate models 
for how to manage faculty. And I see the big distinction there is that the lower status universities are more heavily managed than the higher status universities in terms of faculty because faculty who are able to sort of move outside the system and get EU grants and bring in money are able to bargain and to create um, uh, power for themselves that makes management have to take them seriously uh, and deal with them, whereas the others can be treated um, more like all other workers. Um, there are incentives for academic industry partnership in, in the EU as um, in most other countries. And uh, also things are geared to, make, uh, to meet labor market demands in some way vocationalizing large parts of the university system. Um, and again, the increased R&D funding creates hierarchy and status difference. Uh, and I think encouragement of interdisciplinary uh, research is in many ways a way of um, disempowering the traditional disciplines. I mean, that was the strength. That was where faculty were able to draw boundaries. And it was limiting in some ways um, because, because it's harder to, to move across the boundaries legitimately. And there's much to be said uh, about why that creates problems for critique. But I think more problems are created for critique when funding is more directed and um, more interdisciplinary because the profession themselves loses control of the field. So statistics um, started as the science of the state. And the statistics gathered on, e on the European Union and the European research area create an administrative area. And one has to ask, is it the pre prelude to a state? Probably not, but certainly to a powerful administrative area that's able to organize um, to direct resources for universities, through universities to corporations. And so the social technologies play into this by creating soft discipline for smart professionals. Um, and then the social technologies uh, that do that provide the methods, theoretical frameworks, and concepts which are simultaneously discourses and narratives themselves for the social technologies, like bibliometrics, so we can count all your publications down to the last detail and how many co-authors there are and where you are in the parade of co-authors and so on and so forth. Ranking in league tables, soft law, open method of coordination and the other social sciences that don't participate in the social technologies um, language. Um, then there are interstitial organizations, which as Michael Mann says, spring from the intercisives of already existing organizations. And um, in the US, these were spontaneous and incremental. Uh, the state did not push them. The universities in competition with one another were what pushed them. Technology transfer offices are an example. Once um, uni one university started having them, other ones wanted it because they wanted to be in a position to be able to um, move technology, these new license, now that they had the ability to patent and license to other uh, they w wanted to be able to move this out very quickly, and they created offices to help that happen. And there was no state mandate, no nothing. The only thing was the National Science, Science Foundation said that you had to sort of have somehow monitor um, what was patented. It said nothing about an office. You could have signed one person to do it. 
in some science department, but these just sprang up and became nodes of opportunities that, uh, again, stress and push and move forward a particular brand of uh, innovation. The EU was more uh, state-led. Um, an example would be the uh, EC, I can't read this with my glasses, EC frameworks, um, which were systematic procedures for setting R&D tech transfer agendas, thematic, um, well, you can read it up there yourself. But um, that's what uh, the, 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 the course the EU took, again, being more state-led than it was in the U.S. What? Okay. And there were also state-led interstitial organizations um, in, in, in the U.S. and um, a number of them. And then you get not only science and technology, you get offices for full fees paying students, international students, distance education, so on and so forth, um, as a way of marketizing. And what these interstitial organizations are are switching devices. They channel energy, effort, and resources to new circuits of knowledge, often entrepreneurial, often privatized, and they commit participants to a new academic capitalist knowledge uh, learning regime. And when you do that, you move to expanded managerial capacity because you have to manage all this in a new way. And so there, there are three interrelated processes. Expanded uh, interstitial organizations are being institutionalized. Okay, so you have technology transfer offices, you have research parks, and then they're not these new spontaneous organizations. They're something that's forever part of your organization, are hard to get rid of, and have lots of managers. You also have um, expanded management that is changing the hu human resource profile of education, and that because you now have to have star faculty that are able to get research funds from the various competitions, uh, whether at the EU level or the national level at the US, at the federal level, um, and that you can't afford to pay everybody the same anymore. So you have the star faculty who do largely research. You have many adjuncts and a whole new class of um, non-tenured faculty. And these, again, have to be managed by people who are not faculty. So um, the managerial capacity to monitor, incent, and discipline these highly differentiated numbers of faculty and non-academic professionals keeps growing. So if you can't get a job as a faculty member, you can always become a manager of other faculty. Um, I'm going to skip the example um, because we're getting out of time. And um, so what we did in the US was create a space amenable to marketization. And we had laws that shifted that regular tr regulate trustees. So um, they no longer have the same fiduciary responsibility uh, that they once had in the U.S. And they just have the same standard as is the case in a corporation. These are the figures on part-time and contingent faculty in the U.S. as of 2012, more or less. As you can see, 35 years ago, 75% of the U.S faculty were tenure track. And currently, it's reversed. In 1970, part-timers were 52% of full-time faculty. 2007, they were 97% of full-time faculty. In addition to that, we have more like intermediate, intermediate, intermediate staff between faculty and senior management. Um, there are more now of those types of employees in U.S. universities uh, than faculty. The same is true in the EU, although it's not nearly as drastic. Faculty are only, part-time are only 43% 
of full-time and non-academic professionals are not as many, but they're growing uh, rapidly. And you also have um, extreme salary differentiation as this occurs in the U.S. Uh, between fields. That's the biggest um, difference now in the U.S. The top fields in research universities are health engineering, business, not even the physical sciences, despite everything we say about STEM, um, and biological sciences, sorry, we forget them. And the bottom fields are the humanities, educations, educations, and fine arts. Um, so the gap between the top and uh, bottom, I only have figures um, for public research universities uh, in the earlier period. Um, it goes, it's $48,000, and in uh, 2004, it's um, 56000 for the public and 58000 for the private. So if you're a humanities professor, you're making, um, in a public university, you're making $56,000 less than your counterparts in health, engineering, and business and a private university, $58,000 less. So university management has greatly expanded, and managers act more like CEOs or heads of businesses. And universities are able to devise strategies, or at least some universities, to act in a public, nonprofit, or nonprofit mode depending on their goals. And in each of these areas in the U.S., public being the state universities and public resources, um, uh, uh, you have different regulations for all of them with regards to taxes, how money is paid back, how money is bonded, how money is borrowed, and so on and so forth. And the most sophisticated universities can realize, maximize the best of all three, and many other universities are stuck in a single mode. And universities are increasingly managed as neoliberal institutions. So there's new money, and humanities and social sciences don't have it. This is not a surprise. And um, that's it. Am I almost on yeah. time? <laughs> okay. Um, so I think we're ready to start. Um, first of all, uh, let me thank uh, Professor Schiller for her very interesting presentation and also paper. It was a pleasure to read and work on that. Um, and we are trying to contribute a bit to your work through our presentation. <laughs> So we called our presentation University for the Future, and we're going to uh, argue later why we called it like that. Uh, I'm going to our outline uh, quite briefly. We're first going to provide a short summary about uh, the paper. Uh, then we are focusing on trustees, since the paper were, was more about the role of trustees in this new elite of private universities. Um, then we're going to focus more on the neoliberal university. Greta is going to explain us some uh, features of this kind of uh, new model in uh, higher education institutions. And then she's going to introduce us with the risks for uh, higher education personnel and students. And we are going to provide some alternative uh, scenarios coming from the uh, other literature that we explored. And then finally, our questions. Um, so I'm first going to provide some background information about the emergence of these super elite private universities. Okay, perfect. Um, so in the, as the professor mentioned, in the context of a declining state support during the 80s and afterwards, Universities in the US shifted towards a more market-oriented uh, model, uh, knowledge production model, resulting this in the shift or the transition from the multiversity model of uh, university to a neoliberal one. 
the multiversity model of uh, universities uh, actually was uh, a very common model where inputs and processes usually produce some homogeneous outputs which were educated uh, people and some research products. But nowadays universities producing more uh, tailor-made research for industry and um, universities actually are engaging more in market activities and this resulted eventually in the creation of these super elite universities who proved themselves more able in uh, market behaviors. And this resulted in accumulation of capital and resources around these universities. Uh, well, the paper actually focus, focuses more, as I mentioned before, on the role of trustees um, of these elite universities in connecting university with the industry. So, um, here we quoted uh, Harari 2015, the only way to sustain actually capitalism is through an increased rate of scientific discovery. And uh, trustship uh, serves as a mechanism that conjoins university and industry um, and uh, corporates are in this context perceived as um, organizations ready to organize resources for science, which uh, by the, on the other hand is uh, ready to receive these uh, funds from, uh, from, from the corporations and make, uh, produce more research relevant for the industry, creating so the so-called vicious uh, cycle between industry and uh, universities. So I'll, I'll go on with uh, summarizing uh, the main points of uh, the paper. So the main assumptions were that trust is, yes, play an important role in organizing resources for science. And uh, uh, the role of uh, university trustees in public higher education um, is less relevant and because they are not well connected to industry, while on the other hand, tri trustees of elite private uh, universities are highly connected to corporations, government agencies, non-profit organizations, and they use these connections to benefit their universities. So the main research question was actually which are the mechanisms through which trustees of elite private universities forge ties between university and other organizations. Uh, professor explained some of them, but we can summarize into external affiliation, which has some sub-mechanisms uh, which were uh, previously explained, such as uh, the de deactivation of boundaries, then uh, the emergence of interstitial organizations, of intermedi intermediating organizations as well, and foundations. Also, some other uh, core mechanisms are financialization, selection, and uh, trusteeship. Um, and then we move on to the emergence of new uh, liberal universities. Uh, this uh, new phenomenon can be uh, discussed under the light of the triple helix model, where innovation is supposed to be fostered um, through the uh, cooperation between these three main agents, such as the academe, government, and the industry. Um, actually, um, the entrepreneurial university is seen in this model uh, as the core actor in the innovation uh, system. Um, okay, you might have to remind me of some of the questions, but the China one, I, I'm not sure about. That's not a country I've studied um, in any depth. I wish I had, um, I, I, and I just, I just can't answer that one. And if anybody else knows something they would like to contribute, please. I can say just some like small things. Hi, thanks. No, I was just saying like small things. The strategy, as in, in many of the Asian countries, is to develop world class universities. So this uh, there is a like highly stratified system where some universities are particularly fostered by the government. And just one thing about what you were saying, it's not that the state leaves universities and only private enterprises or foundations are funding universities or students paying for tuition and fees. Not only that it's different according to the regions, and there are many differences in different countries, but also the state participation, for instance, in the United States, and probably you can uh, get in, in deep about this, the state participation has changed. Instead of just giving block grants 
to universities and then the universities being able to decide what they want to do with that money. They have competitive calls all the time and still like the NH NIH and other N uh, National Science Foundation as well and many other organizations from the United States government give a lot of money to universities but that money is also conditioned to being related with private enterprises. So in the end, it's public money that goes to private enterprises, and that is also the case in China, of course. So that's why I was making this point. China is also having like a, a, a lot of funds from the state, but directed towards the top players defined by the government. Thank you so much for the answer. Well, um, again, I have studied, not studied developing countries as, as much as I have the developed ones because I'm sort of focusing on the, where the extreme activity is. But um, I think ultimately we will um, in many, many ways, just like we developed countries, highly developed countries like the EC countries and the U.S. have exported a lot of production to developing um, countries in terms of manufacturing, I think we will then um, export a lot of knowledge work to developing countries um, that uh, was once done here. I mean, an example would be like call centers in India, right? But um, where you have to have a certain degree of education, I'm not sure how much, but certainly another language and things like that. And um, maybe a, a different level where you would actually require like a higher education degree, but it would be more like a vocational higher education degree where you had the eight skills you can demonstrate that now I would do it. I would see that, foresee that as uh, coming very quickly. It's probably started already. And that would be yet more hierarchy, right? And stratification because um, um, it wouldn't be like we were sharing the best things with these um, developing countries. Instead, we share the best things with each other, which you do in Europe and we do with Europe as well. It's not that we don't work with Europeans in the United States, but that sort of higher level stuff. All right. <laughs> So we go on to the third and fourth question. The third was, the, what are the implications of academic capitalism on teaching, considering that uh, many funds are now uh, oriented towards research and teaching itself, um, I don't know, is maybe threatened by this new paradigm. Maybe you have a comment on that. And the last question is, uh, potential risk of academic uh, capitalism in treating knowledge as a private good. Okay. So um, I, think, I think for teaching, um, I think teaching is alive and well, but, but largely at the graduate school level. Um, in most systems, including the one you're participating in, the cost of educating graduate students is almost fully subsidized in, in the United States. Not, not completely, but compared to undergraduates, um, the graduate students get all, all the money and all the good things. And um, they get great teacher intensivity, often hands-on in labs, whether it's in the social sciences or whatever, because they're doing research with their professors. Um, at the undergraduate level, I think there could be a lot of wonderful teaching, but probably it wouldn't be by tenured faculty, as we saw from from the figures. That's not to say um, those faculty are not good teachers. Uh, sadly, we don't usually get to compare them the way the um, audits are set up. We can't say these faculty who are non-tenured do better than you know those and so on and so forth. Although that 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 could come, but 
so the teaching may be great at the undergraduate level, um, but since uh, it's a different evaluation system, we don't we don't really know. And the claim is always made that such faculty don't have the creative edge that the tenured faculty who are doing research are have. Whether that is true, I don't think we have empirical evidence on. Maybe on this question, I, I could ask you to uh, compliment about the, the shift uh, be in, inside the uh, academic capitalism regime between the knowledge regime and the knowledge slash learning regime. Uh, I think you make a point about the fact that uh, it started with research uh, and with funding the research to, to move toward innovation. Uh, at, and at some point, uh, uh, learning the, the educative part uh, took a, a bigger role uh, in, in this new uh, economic way of, of uh, working for uh, higher education institutions. Uh, and maybe I was thinking of the case of uh, it's the University of Phoenix, it's called, yes, uh, that uh, I think it's quite stri striking and we, we didn't hear that much in, in Europe. So, so the University of Phoenix is a for-profit institution. Um, that's a corporation, okay? It has, um, it's not a state entity and um, nor is it a um, non-profit. Um, and it uh, educates <clears throat> large numbers of students, although an interesting thing is happening. Um, and it, a lot of it is by internet, it's online, and it's for um, usually adults who have jobs who, this is not a requirement, but this is their audience, the, who don't want to take the time off required to go to school, so they pay for it, they get online classes, they're totally scripted, the people are talking heads, they've got you know, something they read that's common across everything. And um, the, the students um, have a fair completion rate, but they're able to get uh, federal st student aid for it, and without, which is loans, right? And without the loans, people wouldn't go. So then you see, again, the state is paying, and you have to pay back, but um, it's a subsidized rate. And if you, in other words, if you're doing it on the private market, it will cost more. But um, uh, this, the students generally finish, they may get somewhat better jobs or else ultimately no one would go. The big competition is now from public universities who are providing the same sources in a different venue and um, they're usually doing it, they call it off the books, because that way, uh, if they do it through their public institution, they can start a nonprofit foundation and repatriate the money to do whatever they want to within the public university. That's what I meant when I said you can put money where you want to do what you want. And that um, creates real problems for uh, places like the University of Phoenix, because it's the same service, but usually cheaper. Uh, yeah, it was the potential risks of academic capitalism in treating knowledge as a private good, actually. Well, if you treat knowledge as a private good, you have to pay for it. And um, the big thing is, you, you were saying, I was thinking, you were saying, the student as, um, um, uh, they, they, they want it easy, they want it... How can you give somebody who's paying $48,000 a year at a public university as an out-of-state student, how can you give them a D? I mean, that's a bad mark. I don't know, it's probably not your marking system, but it's, a, it's hard to do that. I mean, they're gonna quit instantly after the first semester, take all their money and go elsewhere. Uh, it's, it's a problem when you make it a commodity because uh, it, it, it's, it's not, a, n, n, if it's a real commodity and not a service, but I might have to talk to the economists more about this, uh, then 
then you pay for it. You get a mark. You, you got it. At least a passable mark. Yeah, we saw that also in the light that uh, basic research nowadays, which is basically like uh, real public good, is declining. And um, as we mentioned before, uh, resources are oriented to, towards more making more tailor-made research for industry problems or uh, for innovations for industry more. Like, I don't know if you agree with this. I, I have always had, had trouble with um, the idea of basic research after uh, World War II because so much of it was for defense in the U.S., which was, which was for a purpose. I, I think, though, that, that I don't want to say it's, it's like tailor-made for industry because what industry really wants is innovation. They want something totally, completely new that, as you said, in the work you're doing, will create... Um, really lots and lots of profit instead of just some profit. So they're really willing to, um, uh, the, 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 the federal money, and probably the European money too as well, although I'm less familiar with how your agencies actually, what they actually do. I mean, they will fund, they're trying to fund the next frontier. So it's like, for industry, but um, but not, not tailor-made. It's not like Rockefeller building vertical integration and he wants the next step for it. It's what can we do besides oil that we can all control, unlike solar. And um, that's that's the sort of thing they want to they want to find. And capital, uh, corporate leaders work with the state to say what, what that would be. So it, it, it's a refinement on what you're saying. I'm not completely disagreeing with you at all, but I'm just saying it's still big questions. They can't answer them, the corporate people, because they haven't thought of them yet, but they have a general idea of where it's going. Okay, guys, now it's uh, time for questions. Uh, I will collect, uh, I think, three, three, three questions, and then you could answer. Sure. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Akroza and I'm from Optimum C. And thank you for the presentation. It's really nice to know about this uh, tuition, about how this tuition fee and states, how uh, it's involved. Thank you for that, to giving us some insightful information about it. So my question is about, like, you showed uh, uh, the gap, I mean, the payment gap of uh, the people who are working on business and also uh, mathematics, those fields, and also the field where they have these fine arts and uh, humanities. So, do you, uh, so, part, so how the, this shift has been happened, uh, or is there any shift for the students? They are more now tend to go into those business field or other field uh, 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 rather than the fine arts. Or if these things happen, maybe in the future there will be not much demand from the students to get uh, this kind of subject. So in US, like how it's happened. And another question is about, um, it's about mostly like uh, the tuition fee, for example, in uh, if it is mostly mar market oriented, and this tuition fee is, is if student take loan, and at the end it's some, it, it shows that, okay, they're in uh, default now, they cannot pay it back. So like, what is the point? Yeah. They can't default. No, then at the at the end, like it's state, like who has to pay for it, right? Um, the the position in the United States is students can't default. But that means as long as they're working, their wages can be garnished. That they would take something out of your wages. So a lot of not a lot of people, but certainly some people don't don't they don't work rather than have this big chunk taken out of their 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 paycheck. Um, and you know it's a, it's a it's a it's a trillion dollar debt, right? Yeah. I mean it's 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 very very serious. Um, I really think something is going to have to happen um, about restructuring payment and possible defaults and some change in that, but it's not happened yet. And in the, our current times, it's unlikely to. But but I don't see how you can go forward 
with 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 that because then people just sort of drop out of the whole system. Well, but but not under our current administration, I don't think. Um, and the other question about the that's a really good question about the finance and the humanities. The the first thing is people really like them. So so there's still people in them. And very elite schools uh, have um, have fine arts and and um, humanities, but but not many at the graduate level. They, their their programs there are very good, but very small. But at the undergraduate level, you know, at all these places, you still have them. You still have students, although not as many. The largest major in the U.S. now is business. Um, at the undergraduate level, and that's that's a huge shift o o over time. Um, and uh, the three, when you finish college and you're going to get a job, the three um, professions that pay the most are, um, <coughs> what is it, I'm going to lose one of them, management, consulting, law, and I'm going to lose the third. Okay. No, 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 no. They have to go to school for 16 more years. Um, I can't remember the th third one. Well, there's this great book by Elena, uh, uh, Lauren Rivera where she looks at how elite students get elite jobs. It's called Pedigree. And those, the three fields, the third one of which I'm forgetting, but it's, it's, it's not a science. Uh, um, Management consulting, law, maybe it's just business. But they start at three, oh, I know what it is, it's finance stuff, okay, as opposed to economics, okay. And the, the, those are the three fields where undergraduates from elite universities, their starting salaries are six figures. And uh, only at a, because the elite schools pair them up with the elite firms. But those are the fields people want to be in. They don't want to work as hard as you have to work if you're a scientist um, or an engineer. And then, um, in, in my view, I think, I think uh, finance is an industry uh, for, for U.S. trustees, the, the, the amount of people who are in the finance industry who are trustees of U.S. private universities has grown exponentially, reversing. They used to be all heads of manufacturing firms. Um, and uh, I think that um, uh, that has to do with the planning of, of what gets done. I, I need to think much more about this. Uh, but yeah, so I think, I think the arts and sciences, I don't think you can control the arts and the humanities as well. And if you can't control it, then it's, it's less useful as knowledge as a commodity. I mean, people like it. They want to do what they want to do with it. But I also think universities misrepresent in these fields. They tell you X got a job, Y got a job, but they don't tell you, and the other 80% didn't. At least in, in that field. Thank you, Rebenza. Thank you very much. My name is Akonde Mane. I'm from uh, Opshane. Um, I would like you to uh, clarify the uh, relationship between the uh, mechanism of how the uh, Supreme Court dictates what is uh, patentable or not to and uh, the uh, student paying fees or not. Because I'm aware of the key players that uh, influence the uh, Supreme Court they are uh, pure uh, research institutions that uh, don't recruit students per se. They have, um, uh, they have the employed advanced and uh, good uh, researchers. And uh, although they, they have affiliations with uh, universities, but most of the research are being done by uh, professors and uh, 
and uh, professionals. So I wanted to clarify the, uh, the relationship between what is patentable and uh, academic uh, capitalism. You want to clarify what's what? Uh, the uh, uh, relationship between how the Supreme Court determines what is patentable or not and academic uh, capitalism. about research institutions uh, that don't take students? Yes, that don't take students. Yes. Uh, the key players in, uh, like, uh, for example, the uh, DNA, the, uh, the DNA, the key players, they are research institutions that don't recruit okay. students. Yes, the key players are research institutions that don't have, don't have research institutions. Oh, we... Uh, that's, that's an interesting question. In, in, in the U.S., most universities have students. Um, and the only places I can think of that are, it's like the Rand Institution or something like that. And they may even have students. So generally, um, the universities that do primarily research on graduate students and they want them because they're they're cheap labor and they're they're very bright and they have new ideas and um, um, they become part of the whole process of what happens I mean how can you be a university without students we, we, I know in Europe they have institutions like that are not with students, but that's that's not you. I really can't think of places in the U.S. where that's true. And, uh, and in the U.S., inside a uh, large university um, like Harvard, for example, uh, are there circulations uh, the, of the students from maybe not undergraduate but graduate classes and research labs, or are there that separated? Uh, buildings and, in fact, uh, separated uh, activities, yeah. or it's really... Oh, yeah, they're, they're separate, in, 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 um, but, but they have students, okay? So, um, the, the, the graduate students are very separate than the undergraduates, but, and, but they do have classes and they do have labs, so... Um, and sometimes they have whole schools that are separate, like the medical school is separate. You finish your undergraduate and then you go to medical school. And then same is true with law school, same is true with MBA school. They're all graduate programs that are separate, no undergraduates. And then in the physical and biological sciences, um, professors maybe teach um, one or two undergraduate, what would be one undergraduate class a year, and then everything else is graduate students working in labs with them. And they're recruited, those graduate students, from all over. The question was about Europe or about the... Um, it's about uh, the US, because I understand they don't pay fees. They pay through uh, maybe teaching assistants or a uh, student ship. So I am I want to understand how pay of fees because they are not actually paying fees. So they are not part of the set of students that we are discussing that are paying fees. And uh, then most of the key players, for example, the uh, the DNA and the 3D, they are not. Uh, these are done by professionals in private research institutions. So I want to know how academic capitalism, that is, the mechanism of paying tuition fee, affects how um, the uh, Supreme Court, the politics of uh, determining what is patentable or not. So, you're, you're quite right. In, in American graduate schools, we pay them at the graduate school level. We pay. Well, there's some people can go and they pay for their education. Law people pay for their education. Medical students pay for the first four years. Um, but 
and probably business MBA people do too. But in the physical and biological sciences, we pay people and we recruit them from everywhere. And the, what they do, they're, they're cheap labor compared to what you would have to pay for a, a, a professor or something like that. And they already know a lot of stuff because they're done undergraduate education. But what they do is work with professors on um, research that very likely will be part of this whole commodification process because they're being paid by largely federal grants and contracts. And so they're part of the move. Um, we pay them, but they are working with professors to uh, create research that will be a commodity. And it's part of the academic capitalist part of it. It took me a while, but I, you're right. It, it, we do pay them. And then that's how they pay us. Okay, any other question? Hi. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. It's a pleasure to uh, be able to listening to you after reading your papers and your book. Um, I'm doing a PhD in geography, um, and I'm working on uh, universities, uh, US one and French ones. And um, you mentioned the difference between um, the incremental change in the US and the state-led changes uh, in Europe. So um, what does uh, this difference, this difference um, will change regarding the academic possibilities to resist or to keep apart of academic freedom? Uh, in other words, um, do you think that the US academics would have more power to bargain or um, to keep um, a part of freedom or to change the situation, including regarding the university level, rather than the French uh, or uh, European academics will have to confront more um, uh, legislative uh, reform or more um, government reforms. Because um, I was surprised, for example, when I was in France, uh, the protest would go in front of the higher education government building to protest. Um, whereas in the US, um, and I was in the, the University of Syracuse uh, in New York State, uh, protesters would go to the chancellor office or in front of the university, and it's two different levels, and I just wanted to know what do you think about that. I, that's, a, that's a really interesting question about where resistance will come from and what are the possi possibilities. Um, I think, uh, I actually think that possibilities at the moment are not great in either place, um, but for different reasons. And um, what has happened is with the creation of really elite universities and the stratification and all of that, um, the people who are doing well don't want to protest, whether it's faculty or students. And the ones that might want to protest haven't quite figured it out yet, is, is my take on it. The places where there was the most protest in the 60s were elite universities, okay? Um, or, you know, Flagship universities too, Syracuse would have been one. Uh, we're talking, using these terms loosely. Um, and I don't know in, in, in Europe, um, but I think the, the government seems to me to have, especially now that you have the EU as a player and you know, doing the frameworks and the Bologna process. And I mean, I just think it's, it makes it harder and harder to resist the different levels, right? 
But you would know. You would know more. Do you have something to say about that? Uh, Any of you? No, I, I'm not sure. And uh, I think there are other questions. <laughs> so uh, yes, sure. Uh, for resisting on, on <laughs> transformation in France, especially uh, until uh, today, uh, it's quite homogeneous universities. Uh, we have a very split it system with grandes écoles and universities. So in grandes écoles, it's impossible to resist anything because it's for the elite already. And it's so different that you could have a very local bargain, but it's hard to have a global bargain. And in universities, until today, uh, it's so homogeneous uh, so that the natural um, discussion is with the government. Uh, and that's one of the issues for the government, is to try to, to get out of this situation and to try to uh, increase diversities in universities and to have different local bargains to move forward to, to the market quite uh, faster. And now it's very hard to have high tuition fees in universities. But on, until today, they are very, very low. So there is a possibility of resistance specific in France until uh, they, they, uh, the government is able to make it uh, more um, uh, diverse. Well, one quick addition. The weak points in the United States are if going to college does not repay the investment, in which case that would cause a lot of problems, and the student debt crisis, okay? And I think both of those are real possibilities for resistance. Oops. But, but that's not yet been realized. Just uh, other, other uh, three questions, because we have uh, 10 minutes left. Um, hi, I'm Clara. Um, I'm, so I'm from Quebec. So we had uh, quite a strong resistance toward um, the commercialization of education. Um, and just to feed maybe as like a positive example of how resistance can be made, um, I think that one of the key points of the resistance in Quebec um, was that there was a policy by the government at the provincial level to increase the education fee, um, and that led uh, mobilization throughout the universities. Um, and in a way, this is kind of easier than some of the system here, where it's a bit more per school that you see this, so it kind of divides the, um, the university and the campuses. Um, and actually, if we look at France, even just the physical division of the campus after May uh, 68 is kind of indicator of how actually places where different campus can meet and the uh, students can actually like have this like point of encountering uh, either with like a synchronized pol uh, policy or with just uh, physical spaces or these kind of things um, are actually very strong for mobilization. Um, and what was interesting in the case of Quebec is that the resistance initially was focused on the policy. The policy was an increase in the fees. Um, yet, how it developed, it was really as a critique of the commercialization um, and um, the turn that some campuses were taking. Um, so yeah, maybe it was just a, a, not really a question, but more of like, we have to find these like meeting these are the million dollar questions. I haven't got good answers, so any input is, is, is wonderful. I do think, to some degree also, if you have um, a unionized professoriate or strong student unions, like that has been really slowed things down in the Nordic countries, the student unions. Um, so it's, it's, those are questions to be worked on. The, where does resistance come and from and what are the possibilities? And thank you for that, these last two questions. Hello, I'm Patricia Paul from Université Paris-Est, uh, Créteil, and I'm coming from the field of management. Uh, uh, and I could say I have been one of those kind of uh, academic entrepreneur, manager uh, <laughs> within my university for many years. And, uh, uh, participating quite a lot in the construction of the Europe of higher education uh, through the Bologna process. So 
everything you said about the role of the Commission here and uh, the relation with the states, and which is quite different from uh, research since the Commission has a competency, a shared competency on higher education, which is not the case for higher education, which is still at the level of the state uh, uh, competence, uh, is very interesting to see that uh, well, academic capitalism is running very fast in Europe now, and even in our country <laughs> like France. And uh, since we are talking about resistance, and and in Europe, we are quite used to to, uh, to listen that there is no alternative uh, since uh, Margaret Thatcher. So we have been uh, with 30 years of this issue of there is no alternative. And you presented some elements of alternatives. And there are a lot of resistance. And the, the students I know within the European, uh, which is not very revolutionary, but the European Student Union, which is quite interesting to see how they manage with, within the Bologna process. And, that they, they wanted with other trade unions in the world to develop a global platform in order at least to be aware of the different movements of resistance all around the world. Because in Africa, for instance, with very, very uh, fast uh, uh, growing of uh, academic capitalism, there are a lot of, uh, of resistances. No fees, no cuts uh, is something very strong. And I just wanted to ask you, what about the alternative? Because maybe to, to resist is something, but we have to build uh, alternatives and uh, I have the impression that we are quite weak uh, in this uh, uh, area of research because um, I have not been used so much uh, to academic research, so maybe I'm wrong. Um, no, th th there's not a lot of models out there, but I think that the um, sort of the most, okay, so we, we've, we've Overproduce symbolic workers, right? We can't we can't employ them all, despite higher education. So there are a lot of really well educated people out there, who, with not that much capital, could start different kinds of universities. And it would be, I think you we're at a moment. I was thinking of this the other day with talking talking with Gary Rose, where it is actually possible to create variety in higher education again simply because um, the uh, current um, regime is becoming so, so rigid. And also, there's lots of technologies you can use now that you, you couldn't. Like, I mean, you can, you can you know, find out how to make 3D printers on the internet and stuff like that. I mean, you could, you could it is possible that people could just start creating other systems. I think it's unlikely, but it's my fondest hope. Okay, guys, we have just five minutes left, so just one other question. Hello, I'm at the Regalo, option B. Um, I have a question that also relates funding. And uh, I will start from my country, Italy. And in Italy, like, we are in an electoral campaign, and everyone wants to abolish something. And uh, and one party on the center left proposed to abolish the tuition fees that are at the moment they are um, linked to the progressivity of the tax system. So, who uh, was uh, higher income pays more, and. On average, they are one of the highest in Europe. And someone argued that, is, uh, that free education is a tax on poverty. And I kind of agree on this. So I will say, uh, what do you think it, it would be better to promote growth and to tame the contradictions of academic capitalism to uh, make the, the, the system of funding um, way more progressive and uh, abolish the tuition fees for who comes from a working class um, background, while make uh, well, make uh, well having higher tuition fees for who has the means to to pay for them? What's the better system? I, I think that's a wonderful idea um, to to do that. Uh, and what are the chances that it might happen? Well, I don't know. In Italy, there there are the chances since we start. We, we are we have a, a progressive uh, system in the US for sure it's I know I mean, I mean, it's, just, it's heartening to hear people say I mean that that there's a chance in the US at the moment 
there is no chance, but I still think it's a very good idea. You know, what, what happens to these things, happened to things like this in the US was, um, when you did studies of, of who benefits, who pays, um, the argument was um, the rich will always pay to go, no matter what it is, they don't care. And um, the poor don't pay, or else they borrow. And so the people who end up paying um, the most are probably the lower middle class people, which probably is true. Um, so if you just did it straight by pro progressivity and um, well, instead of trying to plan all these things, if you just said, oh, well, this is the income of your parents, you pay X because this is your tax rate. It just seems so much simpler, but, but I'm not an economic guru, I don't, I don't know. But it would, it would have, a lot of people wouldn't want to do that in the U.S. because there are a lot of, I don't want to talk about the tax code. It's too, too much. I can't talk about it right now. It'll go on forever if I do that. So Cecilia is insisting for me to answer this question. Uh, in France, it's a very strong uh, proposition uh, from the orthodox economists to, to put tuition fees, high tuition fees, and to fund them uh, through, uh, uh, you, you repay the tuition fees later uh, according to your income. So it's, yeah, like in Australia, exactly like in Australia and in England. So it's a way of deferred uh, uh, progressive uh, uh, fees uh, with the idea that maybe at some point in the end they will repay everything. Uh, that's really a, a strong narrative and a very big lie uh, because uh, the, the actual way uh, we fund our education in France uh, through uh, the government um, budget uh, it's through in, to income taxes or globally uh, uh, the fiscal system. So it's actually it's progressive uh, and quite more progressive, uh, especially in the high middle income and high incomes. Uh, and even if you have fiscal evasion and so on and so on and so on, you pay much more through uh, the fiscal system than just paying for your children's higher education. Because that, that will never be progressive uh, with regards to very high incomes. So even if it's 100,000 euros, that's a very small part of your income on, on your, your world life, which is the way you repay your education. So uh, there have been actually uh, empirical uh, estimations of who pays uh, more when it's funded by the, the government's meaning through the, the fiscal system or when you, you pay for your own and it's always more um, uh, redistributive to pass through the fiscal system even if it's far from perfect uh, than to pay directly for you. Thank you. I knew we would hear something from the economic gurus. Yes. <laughs> well, Hi, my name is Maria. Just building upon what Emmanuel asked, basically, I guess the question wasn't well said. The idea was basically about the idea of patentability. The patents that are produced in the U.S. and the universities are basically the university own, yeah. no matter what the student does. But if we see academically, a lot of contribution is majorly done by the student. Um, I, I, I do not want to negate or the idea or veto the idea of professors that are basically working on it, but a uh, major effort is put forward by the student and the research done by the student. But doing so, there is a lot of discrimination done if you uh, uh, give all the power of the patent basically to the university. This is why, uh, this is the reason, major reason why the capitalist approach of knowledge that is being produced in the US and this phenomena is then being adopted by other countries because increase in the number of patents make it uh, one of uh, the ideas that how education is basically developing in the US 
and uh, other developing countries basically try to adopt this framework uh, not going deep into the framework like how this idea is coming from students are basically the major instruments which are producing these patterns so i want you to shed some light on that with that um, what i found missing maybe in the readings too uh, what we read in the course was there is a huge amount of money that is coming into uh, universities in uh, uh, uk and us through donations to donors who has been the ex students or different organizations maybe but this money is not channeled in the proper way in the universities usually indicated in the form of infrastructure and uh, um, uh, it's indicated that infrastructure it's utilized in the way for infrastructure but usually the money is directed towards uh, should have been directed towards giving different loans and scholarships to the students that are studying in us and uk system i want you to shed some light on that thank you okay first question patents the university always owns the patent even if the student doesn't okay if they and, and, and the professor always says it's their patent anyway, because the student is in their lab. And, but the students are essential to produce it. Yes, you're completely right about that. The donations question is complex. Um, the, the donations in the US, and I believe in the UK, are, are in a sense tax shelters for, for, for the corporation or the individual who is giving the money. You should, it, both do, but individuals perhaps more. And it's a, a tax shelter because they don't have to, they get a, they get a big write-off. It's something like um, at least 40%, maybe more depending on how you do it because new vehicles, new financial instruments keep emerging that uh, ratchet this up um, or reinterpret the ones that are there. And so that's a tax shelter for them. You can direct your gift. Your gift does not have to be for um, the university as a whole. Um, so you can give it to the cancer lab. Many people give it to, to for particular pur purposes, like David Koch gave um, over $50 million to MIT for its Cancer Institute and stuff like that. By law, the U.S. universities are required um, to use only 4.5% of um, the fund for the endowment every year, okay? So for Harvard, that's not inconsiderable. That's the biggest endowment, and we're talking about 4.5% of um, uh, 35 million dollars, billion, excuse me, 35 billion dollars. Um, so even that they don't use necessarily for scholarships and so on and so forth. Um, we did another paper that we're not talking about here where we looked to see if over time the interests of trustees and um, uh, research fields of universities converged. Guess what? They did. It predicted, it was a predictive economic analysis and the research policy. And so they're putting infrastructure in these areas where they really want to plan and organize um, for innovation in the future in these big questions ways. There is absolutely no regulation of endowment in the U.S. other than by the IRS. The first thing that has happened in a million zillion years is this tax bill where endowments are going to be taxed 1.4% um, across all endowments, big and small. So it does nothing to change hierarchy, won't hurt the big ones. And um, we were having a big argument among colleagues about why if these trustees at the most elite universities are really powerful, um, that happened because certainly their universities lobbied against it and um, My answer was they don't they would rather have the university take the hit than their personal foundations Most of which they have I don't know whether that's right or not, but that's just my 
my intuitive guess until I can find out more about it. But it's all bound up in a million other financial processes, the donations. Does, am, I, am I helping at all or making it more opaque? No, no, it's helping out, but I just wasn't clarified on the fact that why patents, like, still? Uh, because what I feel like all around the world, patents are not necessarily owned by the university. Uh, you, you, okay, there's a lab, a professor who helps the student create a patent, but at the end of the day, that's, that's kind of a student's... Um, Entity, if I must say, I don't know if I'm right or wrong. Like you, you may be right, but that does not happen in in, in the yeah. U.S. Yeah, but don't you think there can be made some reforms on this account? Like I don't know if because academia doesn't talk about it in a very wide way. Like they kind of whenever someone tries to talk about these kind of things, they are like the policy has already been there and it cannot happen. Like. Oh. oh, so you want you want students to be able to have the patents? Yeah, yeah. Of course. <laughs> I, I see nothing wrong with that, but um, I, I don't see it happening easily. And even making it even more complex is many U.S. universities, especially the elite ones, are now not wanting patents. Um, they're moving away from it because it costs too much to manage, too much to litigate, too much to do whatever. And one of the marks of uh, these places is that they have these really flexible intellectual property arrangements that um, that they are partners in many ways with the companies that own it because of this boundary deactivation, so they don't have to put up with all the legal hassles that come with it. Thank you. I wish I could be more encouraging. <laughs> Maybe if we start these other kinds of universities, we could, we could do patents. that. Yeah, we could have all the patents. And they would be on things that would be more useful to humankind. That was of the money. Okay, guys, time uh, is up, so thank you okay. so much. Let, let me say say thank you to all of you. You asked wonderful questions, and it was fun to talk to you. And your questions always um, were very deep so that I could learn something. Thank you. Thank you so much for your